Hey folks, and welcome to the Guns, Gear, and Grub channel. I want to do a video today about the different types of receivers you'll find in different types of AR-15 rifles and how they're constructed. And I also want to briefly touch on other rifles as well. Now, there's a big debate on the online forums and the uh, different videos on YouTube as to um, which type of receiver is better, whether it be the forge receiver or the what they call the billet receiver. Now, for those who might not know, um, I'm going to go ahead and give a brief description of each type of, uh, of um, receiver. A forge receiver is what the real mill spec calls for. To do is they take a, a giant forge, which is like a, kind of like a hammer, and they actually stamp out, they hammer out a, um, a rough shape from a hot aluminum um, bar or brick to go ahead and um, give a rough form or rough shape of, of, of the lower receiver and everything so will be closed and they go ahead and they mill out the uh, like the fire control pocket, the magazine well, all the little holes and paint, you know, places that are needed for little paints and, uh, and different things like that. So that is a basic hammer forge receiver. Now I don't have any to show, but I do have um, here some samples of billet receivers. Now a billet receiver starts out like this. Solid brick of aluminum. Now this is a 7075 aluminum that has already undergone its uh, T6 heat treatment. Now think of it like this: a billet receiver is essentially like a sculpture. They we go ahead and remove the aluminum layer by layer until we get down closer to something like this. You see, this is mostly machined out already, but you see back here. This um, the buffer tube uh, or the receiver extension hole is still not drilled, and a few things here are not drilled. Um, this is a you know this is in the process of being machined, and this is one of our M43 rifles. It takes the AK mag. Yeah. I'll show you that we're in production as opposed to somebody else who has stolen our, our idea and has, has not gone ahead and released their rifle yet. And this is a more Finish. This is actually, actually completely finished, it's just waiting to be um, anodized and actually have the serial number inscribed upon it. Now, which one is better? First of all, the forge receivers are much cheaper than the billet receivers. You find the forge receiver, if you can look around for it, you can find it for a strip lower, $75, $65 even. Remember a couple of years ago, I was buying them in one summer. I was getting for fifty-five dollars shipped to my, you know, to my FFL. Um, you look for a, a, a billet lower. Well, quite frankly, they're three hundred bucks minimum, two eighty, two ninety, for a decent or any billet uh, billet lower upper. Now, is it worth it? Um, some people will tell you the forge is stronger. Uh, the, the billet's not as good as the forge. Because when it's forged, it has a tendency, they say it has a tendency to get the molecules closer together, getting tighter together when the hammer forges it. Um, I personally believe that seeing is believing. Now, that being said, I'd like to go ahead and give an example here. Uh, we did some tests. We actually um, fired high pressure rounds. Now, most high pressure rounds fired in a, in a firearm for testing are 30 to 40 percent over pressure. So if a round has a, uh, has a standard um, chamber pressure of, let's say, I don't know, 50,000 PSI is a 30 out of 6 wood, the high pressure rounds fired would be about 70 to 75,000 PSI. Now, we took the highest pressure rounds we could find for 223, and we fired them out of both a forged and a billet um, rifle. The the pressure on these rounds were just about 90,000 PSI and I'll tell you right now both upper receivers were destroyed not usable anymore this is what happened to the billet upper receiver you see here this wall is completely blown off of the uh, thing here but the ejection port cover base is still intact it's not usable, and out here it has definitely deformed the bubble, formed a nice large bubble there. Let me get it closer. This large bubble. This has come up. 
Catastrophic failure? Absolutely. Would it have injured a shooter? No. This is what happened to a forced upper receiver. Completely blue in half. Whole slide came right off. I know this is not something we cut open to go ahead and show any extra effect or any uh, anything like that. This simply is what happened to a forged upper receiver under a, um, a ultra high pressure round. You can see here the shear marks. Now, you may ask, you know, how often is it a, uh, a round gets that high of a pressure or or um, you know, are you really something? Or are you really going to see something three times the normal pressure rate? Well, I'm not an expert ballistician, um, or you know, expert ballistician in, in terms of internal ballistics, or a chemist in, in terms of knowing how gunpowder burns at different stages and different rates. Um, the person I work for worked in IWI for over 40 years, and. At IWI, he has done extensive, extensive, extensive research. He actually head, headed up their R&D department. Um, he did a whole six-month investigation of what it is that is causing rifles to blow up in the field. Why is that once a month, twice a month, or once, twice a week, actually, sometimes in the, in the, in the Israeli military, um, an M16 explodes? The answer is, it has to do with how soldiers treat their ammo. A lot of times he found in the field, when cleaning, soldiers will take ammo that are dropped in oil or, or literally submerged in oil or kerosene or, or something like that, some cleaning fluid, and they go ahead and put it in the rifle. Now, this changes, they did a whole study, this changes the actual chemical comp composition of how the gunpowder burns. It causes different pressures and different peak pressures and things like that. And he found it causes pressures that can actually exceed 90,000 PSI. So, just to go ahead and give a little example, if you take care of your rifle and your ammo, you should not never see something like that, but just to go ahead and kind of add my two cents to the debate, seeing is believing, the forged receivers are not as strong as the built receivers. The built receivers will take a lot more abuse before they go ahead and they fail. I'll tell you something else I've seen. The pinholes in forged versus um, versus uh, 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 billet receivers. Um, this here is a, a Colt factory rifle. This is probably from the 60s. Uh, probably from the 80s sometime. Um, the pinholes here are starting to kind of, kind of starting to open up, getting a little loose and sloppy in the tolerances, which is fine because the pins are locked in with the, uh, the springs and, and, and the J-pins. But from my personal experience, what I've seen here is that the, the, the billet lowers go ahead and they maintain their pinholes uh, to tighter tolerances for a much longer time. I'm talking 20, 30,000 rounds before those things even begin to start loosening up. Now, one last thing I'm going to talk about is actually just something interesting. Um, we have here, um, we do sometimes we refurbish galils for different customers. Uh, we will actually go to the army, we have this huge warehouse, and we go sift through like these huge crates of galils. We bring a couple of headspace cases with us and we start checking them. Um, so one customer had ordered about 75 galils to be shipped, and we take them back, we, uh, we, we refurbish them, we, we, we convert them to, to, to semi auto, and we ship them out around the world. And you know, I was. This is one particular rifle. I, I you know, I, I don't know who checked it or, or how it got to us, but I always do a visual inspection of the bore as well as a, uh, a rough, uh, you know, throat erosion gauge to make sure the bore saw some life in it. So generally, these rifles are packed in cosmoly, and I went ahead and threw a rod down there. Couldn't get the rod down all the way through. I said, wow, you know, that stuck around. So I started tapping on it with a little bit of a hammer. Here I'm just drive that uh, round on that. No luck. So, try from the other end. Nothing. Finally, go ahead and I measure how deep it's going on one end, how deep the other end. I realize the gap is about that long. So we throw it on the middle, open it up, and what we have inside about seven or eight rounds from one end to the other, wedged into each other.
I've never seen something like that before. Um, usually after one round and you hit another one hits it, the barrel is very likely to explode. These are hammer forged barrels from IWI. Uh, these are some of the best barrels in the world. And um, this barrel withstood, you know, we counted seven or eight before, you know, the first one fell out, the back one fell out. But this thing barely shows a bulge. And there are seven rounds being packed into one another that became essentially one solid round. And it's quite impressive. We, uh, we took the receiver and we milled off the front end wide. Usually the receivers on the leels, if they crack when it's hard to go, will start showing signs of wear over here. Right in these corners there, they'll crack open. And uh, over here sometimes, we'll get, so we, I was expecting to see a crack down there. So we went ahead and milled the front, that, front end off and took a look at it and we couldn't find anything. Just to go ahead and show you the uh, testament of the, of the quality of the Galil rifle. It is a one sturdy, you know, hell of a rifle. This thing is, can take a beating. Um, I've seen guns that have probably have shot 100, 200,000 rounds out of them, and these things are, are going strong. Um, recently, I was we were doing the whole, uh, whole uh, you know, refurbishment thing. And the guy I worked for, um, who was actually involved in the design, heavily involved in the design of the guns, like one of the chief uh, designers, um, he looked at the serial number and he said, holy cow, it's one of the first hundred Galileos ever made. Um, he recognized the number right away. And we looked at this rifle and it had been used. And remember, this rifle was made in 1973 in military service about a couple of years ago. And this thing had been used ever since. And, and you know what? We, we actually took it, we selected it, because it was good to go. There you have it folks, just my two cents. If you have the money for it, and, you, and, you, and it's not too much of a financial bother for you, go ahead and spend the money on the billet receiver. I recommend getting the billet upper, rather than the billet lower, because the billet lower, the lower receivers see much, much, much less abuse than the upper receiver does. And if there's a case that there is a catastrophic failure, it is the upper receiver that will go ahead and, and shield you from the blast. So if you have the money for it, go ahead. If you don't, the forged lower, the forged receivers are just fine too. Um, and again, if you, uh, if you have the opportunity to get a Galil at a good price, go ahead and do it. Even the ones that Sentry's making, as much as I don't like Sentry arms for um, ethical reasons, uh, their rifles are actually coming from Colombia, um, which came through IWI originally and actually were actually made in Colombia on IWI machinery. Our, our, what were told to me, excellent rifles. So go ahead, buy those, and I promise you, you'll enjoy them. Thanks for watching.